Hi, everybody. I'm Wendy Murdoch, and this is Webinars with Wendy. I am continuing to do a series of webinars talking to great equine horse people and talking about all different aspects of horses. Today, my guest is Karen Partish, and she's going to continue our conversation about cranial sacral therapy for horses and humans. So welcome, Karen. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me back. I'm, I'm excited to do this again. So, and I'm glad it's not um, thundering and lightning at either one of us, a location at the moment, right? Absolutely. <laughs> so Karen, for anyone who, who doesn't know you, why don't you just give us kind of a brief uh, story of how you got to do what you're doing, and then we can roll into your topic. Okay, so I'm Karen Partish. I'm based in Sarasota, Florida. I'm licensed as a massage therapist and nationally certified. And I specialize in a technique called craniosacral therapy, which is a light touch hands-on modality that works um, with a whole lot of things, primarily with the nervous system uh, and optimizing its um, ability to help us heal, how to, how to um, optimize our healing process. The body is really good at self-correcting, at self-repairing, and sometimes it needs a little help. And I'm all about being that support system to um, help help it help optimize it. So, awesome. um, yeah. And then uh, many years ago, um, I've been doing this for about 20 years. I rode professionally for many many years um, in Northern Virginia, uh, mostly, and um, got out of body work or got out of horses and um universe wouldn't quite have me do that so it dragged me back into um, massage school in a very circuitous kind of way and uh early on in massage school i had a friend that said you have to go take this cranial sacral class and i went oh, okay and um i took the class and it was um this beautiful balance of energy work and physical and physical and physical work and i loved the dyna the dance between the two because we are energetic beings and we're also physical beings and so that dance is very relative <clears throat> during that class um i was we were on break and we had just finished a trade and i was speaking with the instructor and um, so we finished up that conversation and she turned to walk away and um, she took a step and turned back and said, by this way, by the way, we do this work with horses. And I was one of 60 people in a class. She didn't know me at all. It was a total intuitive hit for her. And she just turned around and fed the information to me. And I literally dropped my jaw and have what I call my moment of inspiration where I went, oh, and I saw my career light up in front of me. So, and I've never looked back. So um, I came out of that class and I said, find me some horses to work on. <laughs> so and, awesome. And I was instantly back in the horse world again. And I've been thrilled about being able to come in this time as a, um, as uh, a, from the therapeutic, realm versus the trainer realm or the you know that kind of this showing and competing and all that kind of stuff so um it's a much softer kinder space for me so that's awesome that's really neat all right so what are we going to talk about today uh so i love the topic that you suggested the first time we spoke which was the work between people and horses and there is such a beautiful dynamic that happens. Um, you know, horses are all about, they're so much happier when they're in a herd, right? So there's that herd dynamic going on. And then when they work, when we work with them one on one, it's natural for them to have that herd dynamic with us, right? And um, I always feel like part of my job is balancing that or seeing if it needs more balance. And if it, if, if that balance wants me to play with it a little bit. So there have been situations, um, you know, where people get in tough situations with their horses, right? And some pretty sticky ones. And um, 
if it hasn't happened to you, you or any of the listeners, um, you probably know of somebody that's been in a bad fall or a bad jam or the horses spooked or those kind of things that can be pretty terrifying. And that residual trauma sits in the tissue. And I am always so honored when someone says, oh, my horse had this really scary accident and would you help it? And I always bring the owner in and have them stand close and end up working with the both of them. And it's amazing that the tears that get shed and the, um, the energy rebalance that happens and the dynamic. Um, so it's fun to play with. And there's been um, a couple of those moments that I will never, ever, ever forget and probably should write about them and things like that because they are pretty magical. And uh, last time you had mentioned, Wendy, that um, you were having some problems with your liver about the same time your horse was having problems with the liver, right? So yeah. what, was, what was that all about? Well, uh, so I had a quarter horse named Andy that I uh, got in 99 and um, in 2004, I can't remember why we, we checked his liver enzymes, but there, there was something he was just looking off or whatever. I, you know, I don't, it's so funny that you don't remember why you've done something when you do it, <laughs> right? But we checked his liver enzymes and they were elevated. And I thought that was kind of interesting. And so he, he was, li he lived at Dr. Joyce Harmon's place. So we put him oh, on some Chinese okay. herbs, right? Um, to balance yeah. his liver. And he was a fire horse. So if you know Chinese five element theory, yep. he was solid fire. Right. Gregarious as could be when things were good and hysterical when things were not. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time he was in a good place, right? And so then uh, a few months later, I um, I had bought a house and I had applied for life insurance because I owned a house, right? And in October, I got a letter from the insurance company telling me that my liver enzymes were elevated and that I had hepatitis C. And yeah. that's how I found out that I had hepatitis C, which I did not know I had wow. and probably got from a blood transfusion when I had my major wreck in, in 94, uh, 84. Uh, uh. So, you know, there's no way to really know, but I had units of blood back then mm. and, um, they weren't testing for hep C at that time. Right. So it was interesting that my horse was expressing elevated liver enzymes and took a little while. I think we checked him in the summer. That's kind of my recollection. I'd have to go back and look at the paperwork, but right. that I found out in October. Now I'm, I have been cured of hep C. Thank you to some really good drugs that they came up with. And Great. that's yeah. a long story, which I actually told on horse radio news when the pandemic started, but okay. um, you know, so, but it was fascinating because he was, he was always my emotional self. If I was in a bad place, he was always <laughs> mirroring that. So right. Right. Kind of followed along each other pretty closely. <laughs> the, um, how, how beautiful that, um, that you listen to that you and, or your vet listen to that inner sense to go get the liver enzymes checked. Right, because as you say, it's not a very typical thing to check on horses in particular. You yeah. know, um, people we get them; it's part of the the general checkup thing. But um, with the horses, anyway. And I'm really glad you resolved your Hep C. That's wonderful. And yeah, did um, wow, but we got there. I had to yeah. wait for the drugs <laughs> that we yeah. have now. Right. And did um, and how was his liver through all of through your whole health? Well, process? so I. Um, I started working with a DO and then I finally went back to my Chinese herb uh, person who she's right across from NIH actually. She's an amazing Chinese herbalist and acupuncturist. And mm. she kept me on Chinese herbs so that my liver enzymes were totally normal for years. Right. And people didn't know um, right. the kind of schedule I ran with hep C. Nobody had any idea. because, um, But his enzymes were fine after that too. They, so we they both were. got settled out. <laughs> right. Oh, beautiful. So, um, uh, you know, the, again, the animals taking on things, I always think that's part of that, that herd dynamic, right? That what they call field theory, right? That energy dynamic to help balance everything out. And so, um, so how astute of you to um, capture that moment and work it out. So, 
Um, yeah, there's there's a couple of beautiful stories I have. Um, one one favorite one was um, an uh, RN client of mine. Um, I see her and her horses, and she has this fabulous, big, very stoic horse um, who doesn't express much emotion at all. And I was treating him and they had had kind of a weird accident where she had come off and um, actually, and broke a bone. And so she would always ride in a jacket and a vest, right? And just, just to be safe. And she's again, an RN and she's smart and she's wants to take care of herself. And I did a beautiful piece with them all about um, just helping them connect and um, feeling past the fear and being able to release that trauma that was show expressing in that moment, right? Again, lots of tears. You could see the, this very stoic course start to just really relax and soften the head, soften the jaw, soften the ears and eyes. Um, and for him, that was an, an exceptionally huge move. And of course, the t and the people around that were there, a couple of the people that were there were, were all crying and um, again, exuding emotion and allowing it to come up and out. And um, she never felt the need to wear her vest again. Um, so fascinating. Yeah. She said it was always like right before she get out, she said, oh, I need my vest. And that like thought didn't happen. She would wear it occasionally when she trail rides and stuff like that. Um, but, um, but the fear behind the vest, in other words, vest isn't a bad idea for a safety to protect yourself. But if you're doing that from a fear base, exactly, as opposed to a choice base, I think right. it's good to look at it. Right. So, so it was just one little way to shift. And she had talked um, after when I checked in, she was telling me about the vest. She also said the connection that they have just really opened up and got bigger and stronger, which was really quite beautiful. So um, now did you do cranial on, on the horse or the person for that? Both actually, both at the same time. It's it's similar way I would um, treat um, like a mom and a baby. Right. So the mom and the, because okay, so, because I've taken a cranial cycle one right up ledger right, and you have right. to put your hands on. So I'm trying to see: do you have a hand on the person and a hand on the? How'd you do that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So how, however you left, however it works out. So if I can get them both together, I, um, in the case with the, the, the nurse and her horse, um, I just had her stand with her hand on the horse. And then I found a way to where I could like really visually take in the expressions and things like that, the subtle visual clues. Um, and then, yeah, a hand on the horse and a hand on the person. Um, and when I have uh, a parent and a child, um, come in, um, I'll do the same thing. A hand on mom, a hand on the baby. Sometimes it's just the baby. Sometimes it's just the mom, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, uh, things like that. Sometimes the moms bring the, the kiddos in because they need work. Right. I don't, I don't treat a lot of kids, but, um, but I do have a couple that I see on a regular basis. And, um, it's often, um, the reflection of what's, of what's happening around them, right? Mm -hmm. And the kids are just a lot more transparent about it than oh yeah um, <laughs> than we are. Like the horses are a lot more transparent about it. Again, the um, the simplicity of animals and children, right? It's really just um, a much more. Um, it's easier to get to the stuff, right? Us us big strong adults, we do so much during our days, and we don't always express all of our feelings and emotions, right? And a lot of times we're stuffing them down. So and a great example was I was sharing with you just before we signed on about I was a little anxious and um, this is not normal for me to be doing webinars. And um, so, woohoo, <laughs> <You know? laughs> like take advantage of it. Oh my God, <laughs> you know? versus run the other way. I don't wanna do this. <laughs> Yeah, it's so interesting because we were talking about that and you need a little bit of sympathetic, you need a little elevation. I, I used to, uh, when I was going to do presentations, if I didn't have a little bit, I wasn't sure it was going to work. 
right? right. If I came in too calm, I was like, uh oh, this might not not be one of my better lectures, right? Yeah. But if I come in just a little bit, uh, you don't want to be too far. Like I could, I've done a few where I had too much coffee, <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. <laughs> yeah, you want you want to have that flexibility in the nervous system, you know, all the time, all the time. And sometimes we lose that. So um, it's important. It's important. Um, one of the other things I, I would love to talk about is um, I have I have a kind of quick and easy way um, that I check on the tone of the vagus nerve, right? So when we talk about sympathetic and parasympathetic, and I know your pads are so great at working with stoic courses and, um, and so is my work. And stoic, like this horse that belonged to this nurse, is very, very stoic and doesn't go into a freeze mode. But, and you know, and I know that there are horses that um, hide their emotions and then easily can go into a freeze mode. Yeah. So and, can I, may, maybe you're going to talk about this, but let me just ask this question because maybe we're backing up a little bit. Um, okay. What is the connection between cranial sacral therapy and the cranial nerves and, and vagal nerve? Okay. So um, the, the cranial nerves come out of the cranium. So they are in the brain stem. And so as we progress through our training in craniosacral therapy, we get introduced to the cranial nerves. You get introduced to a lot of them, even in cranial one, how they go through, come off the brain stem and then go through different bones in the, in the cranium and then come uh, most of them stay in the cranium, but the vagus nerve and the spinal accessory come out of the cranium and um, express in different ways. So vagus nerve is the longest cranial nerve, goes through and in, down into the trunk, controls, um, it's a big player in parasympathetic mode. So it's not the only player, but it's a very big player in the in parasympathetic tone. And again, getting us out of high sympathetic. So uh, high sympathetic is the fight or flight and parasympathetic is the rest, digest, recovery part of that. So at the extreme of the sympathetic is, the, is a freeze component that is often connected to trauma. So not always, but often. Um, it's, you know, the big example would be if, um, an animal is getting stalked like a mouse or a rabbit, things like that. They often go into freeze mode as, as if I'm not here, you can't see me. And, um, it often throws off the predator. And so once the predator has gone, the animal, the bunny, whatever it is, will shake and run off. And that shake that they do is releasing that freeze tension. We have not perfected that yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I'm just, you know, that shake makes me think of my cat. You know, I'll pick up my cat and I'll pet my cat. And when I put her back down, she'll often shake before she walks off. Yeah. Right. So, is that in a way shaking off? Although she's, what's really interesting is that she was the shy one of the two that we got. And the longer we've had her, the more she likes to be cuddled. Uh, and, but in the beginning, you know, it was like, oh, I'm not so sure, right? right. You'd put her right. down and she'd shake. And she'd shake, right. So that's just a, an easy way for them to rebalance and reset their nervous system. I think the story I told that when I introduced myself last time was um, when I was just a, a little kiddo, like five or so, I got, put on my very first pony and the pony shook from nose to tail as soon as I hit the saddle. And I know it was all about rebalancing my nervous system. So I instantly fell in love with horses. I'm like, oh my God, they can look what they can do as a five-year-old. You know, it took me till I was into my cranial sacral training that I realized how important that moment was. Yeah. <laughs> so so yes. So so then, um, I, you know, I keep looking at the human skull that you have behind you there on the shelf. Yeah. Um, and I keep thinking about, all right, so I, I hadn't, sounds funny, but I hadn't put together that when you're doing cranial sacral therapy, of course, all the cranial nerves that are staying in the cranium are being right. affected. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. 
surprise As i know this- it's, you know sometimes it's just like those moments where you're like duh <laughs> right that's why i'm here that's why i'm here to help connect the dots right yeah um, yeah and then the dora comes down the nerve right follows follows the nerve out and uh, especially like on our eyes and things like that that um so if the dora has has tension in it for whatever reason whether it's trauma or physical or whatever that um mobilizing the 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 bones in the skull the fluids in the skull getting the fluid and fascia getting the energy moving getting it all back in that dynamic state again that it allows the fluids to come in and um andrew taylor still who's the father of osteopathy here in the u.s um basically said you got the fluids moving the, the body is good to go you know or on the right path to healing and it's so true so a lot of my work is really about the fluids and the energy behind it so that the body can then self-correct so rebalancing all of that so again getting getting the dura moving helps the cranial nerves helps um again feel in vagal tone and all that kind of information so all right yeah so I, and then, okay, so let's jump ahead. So the, the vagus nerve is cranial nerve 10 and cranial nerve 9, 10, and 11. I call them the good neighbors, right? And they're, they're, um, their root, and so the nerve root are very, very, very close together, 9, 10, and 11. So 9 is the glossal pharyngeal, and I'll, that, um, What's important about that to this discussion is that one of the nerve branches goes into the salivary glands in the back of the tongue on the people on people and on horses. And then there's um, cranial nerve 10, which is the vagus nerve, the wanderer. And we love the vagus nerve to have lots of tone so that it doesn't overreact or underreact, right? So we want it to have that dynamic flexibility. And then cranial nerve 11 is the accessory or what they call the spinal accessory nerve. And that actually goes down, um, down the neck into the sternocleidomastoid on us and into um, the upper traps for us, our upper trap. Oh, interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So the days, <laughs> right. We all relate us busy women, right. We all relate to running around with our shoulders as earrings, right. Uh, so again, back to the good neighbor theory is, you know, with good neighbors, when one's in trouble, you go, the other one says, Hey, my neighbor's in trouble. We have to go help. Right. So when cranial nerve 10 is so vagus nerve is not toned well is going ah help me i don't have enough wherewithal to get you back into sympathetic tone or parasympathetic tone right you're go you're going over the edge you're going over the edge our shoulders go up right so the good neighbor is saying help cranial nerve 10 so that's where you recognize. So when my when clients walk in my office and they're like this, I go, ah, how about we just do breath work for a couple minutes? And it's like, oh yeah. And suddenly my job gets a whole lot easier, mm. right? So when I'm treating stoic horses, I want to know if they're stoic because they're in pain or because it's um, a learned behavior. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the quickest way for me to check is to check the vagus nerve. And then what I do is go to cranial nerve nine and I check their mouth. Are they, do they have a very dry mouth or do they have a moist mouth? So the horses with the dry mouth are in high sympathetic tone because they're uncomfortable. Right? Well, and the other thing that, that makes me think when you're, when you're talking about this, is, you know, when I use surefoot pads, I, I see what I think of as the equivalent of the shrugging. Yeah. It's when you can see that their, um, their whole, like oftentimes you'll see their elbow away from their body yeah. and they're holding with the muscles at the top of the shoulder blades in a, right. essentially a shrug, right? Yep. And then yep. as they stand on surefoot pads, you'll see that change and you'll see the whole um, chest shift in relation to exactly. the Exactly. You see the chest start to open up when they get more in parasymp- 
and back into parasympathetic, right? Yeah. So it's this beautiful visual. Not, um, uh, not everybody has your astute eye. So going to the dry mouth is such a quick and easy way to help yourself start to look at it. So for those of you listening, check the mouth. If it's dry, look at their stance. Is that a typical stance for the horse? And if it is, then start to put the pieces together, right? So learn to train your eye. Yeah. Now, I don't know. Do you have the white clover fungus where you live? No, okay. I haven't so, heard about it. Oh, so the, the little bit tricky part here in Virginia and, and up in this area is that when the white clover blossoms come out, there's a oh, fungus and it causes right, the right. horses to drool. And right. um, I did a webinar once and it was during white clover season and the horses would open their mouths yeah. and a bucket of saliva comes out yeah. and the Europeans yeah. were all freaking out watching. <laughs> right. So you have to be careful about that yes. influencing that dry mouth. Problem. Exactly. There are, this is, this is my theory. It's not um, some tried and true um, methodology. It's just one of those quick little down and dirties that's right more often than not. Absolutely. But, but yes, yeah. um, if there's excessive saliva, then you need to wonder what triggered it. And a food source is um, usually the first thing. Yeah. Um, but again, that's a, that can be a vagal tone thing too, as well as lots of salivating, right? So yeah. Um, and it, you know, it's just kind of, um, it's just something to be aware of in the areas where you have the problem. You know, it's not everywhere. So yeah. Um, it, it, but it, if you've never seen it, people freak out when the yeah, opens his mouth I, I up can see of food. Yeah, that would be that would be a little horrifying. Yes, yeah, it is. Even when you know about it, because even you when you your, feet, it. your back gets soaking, you're always like shrugging yeah. to get away from it. Right. So one of the horses that convinced me my theory was um, worth talking about because I had been playing with this for years and thinking. Um, is this really, you know, am I making this up or is this real? But I had, and I got to treat a horse, um, was quite lovely horse. Um, the person that owns him, um, got him from the breeder and the horse is now, um, in double digits. So I think he's like, you know, 12, 15, something like that. And he's a lovely dressage horse. And every once in a while he bolts out of, seemingly out of the blue. And he can be fine for three weeks in a row. And then one day he, it triggers and then it's bad for a couple of days. And, and he, of course, you know, every vet's looked at him and she's in an area where they got some pretty smart vets. And um, so I came down and treated him and uh, it felt like nerve pain in the shoulder to me. And no, none, no one had talked about that. Um, so I, I checked his mouth and it was bone dry, super dry. And, you know, the horse has got good hay, good food, you know, good care. Um, so it wasn't anything from that. And, oh, so spent some time working with him, just trying to mobilize the tissue and kind of get the energy in the body flowing a little bit better. And, um, take some of the pressure off that, um, off the nerve and his shoulder. And, um, by the end of the session, definite signs of relaxation and a very moist mouth. And, um, so I said, okay, I, I get it now. <laughs> so that was one of my fun little stories about that. So, um, and, and have you seen that horse since I have, and has and that helped the problem? It, um, it's definitely helped the issue for sure. It still triggers once in a while. I don't see the horse very often. Um, it's not like I see him regularly. Um, it does come back. Um, I did talk about your pads <laughs> and said that would be a really good, uh, use of, of the sure foot pads. And, um, and she played around with them a little bit. So um, it was good. So well, I'm just of, curious, you know, I mean, and it's so hard when you don't get to see the horse every day, if, right. if she had noticed a correlation between his mouth being drier when she had the problem. That's really, yes, she definitely, um, yeah, 
she does and one of the, one of the boarders in her barn um has taken some of my classes and was there taking notes and so she's paid attention to that and it has followed the pattern it has followed the pattern so yeah because i mean that's a great clue and, and something that you can easily notice and then address right so that you right. don't end up with the problem and you know it, it's good for us too when we think about it when our shoulders are up not that that ever happens to me <laughs> <laughs> so again it's it's just i find myself driving this way and it's like oh no no breathe 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 you know get the breath back and so so that's always a fun way to process that so yeah so it's right. it's really interesting and um you know that the whole idea of the connection between the cranial work because again when i go back to thinking about it we were talking we were working uh, with the bones of the skull and just right. feeling the bones and the and the cranial rhythm um right. but you tend i guess for me you just tend to kind of um I guess when you're learning something, you get more into the working on the technique and you don't think about the connections that it has through the entire system, right? Uh, like the effects on the other cranial nerves. So what are some other like signs of a, like there's, um, okay, here's my, I just forgot. How many cranial nerves are there? I just blanked. There's 11. <laughs> okay. It's a, yeah. Right. Somehow I thought there was 12. I don't know why. There, there, um, some people call it 12. Some people say it's 11, but I, you know, uh, most people say it's 12. But okay. Maybe again. that's why I'm like just a little confused. But, you yeah. know, when, what are some of the other um, effects that you'll see when you're doing cranial work on the other cranial nerves? Like, how do we, is there a way to um, observe? those influences so one of you know one of the ones with the horses is the, the facial nerve right comes down and branches in a couple different directions and it, it can be a major cause of head shaking oh right so head shaking can trigger from one from cranial nerves so very easily so an improper fitting bit or bridle or noseband or um you know a horse that um hasn't had good dental work or, you know, things like that can definitely right. tr trigger up into that or um, not ridden very politely. <laughs> right? So, or weird head injuries, you know, horses are known for that too, you know, so. Yeah. Um, you know, and one of the things I've noticed on, on some horses and I'm, again, I'm looking at your skulls behind you. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you'll see horses that have like, right where the gap of the teeth are, you'll yeah. see this really tight, I don't know that it's a tendon or whether they're sucking in their cheeks, but you'll see a line that goes mm -hmm. right down. And then when they soften, that all smooths out. So right. is that uh, is that one of the cranial nerves that's affecting that or? That's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think it would really depend. Um, that what, um, I you know the line I'm talking would, about. Yeah, I do. I do. I I think it would run a little more into um, their the way they hold hold their breath or um, the hyoid not having full mobility um, and you know a stress element involved. So they're a little more high sympathetic tone and kind in a less than positive way. So um, again, that that holding, holding, holding that that we do and that they do and. Um, I want to make sure that people understand we have that same kind of holding that the horses do too when they Absolutely. hold their breath like that. So yeah, they're yeah. Uh, obviously their face facial structure is different. It's that long face, so you can see things that we wouldn't notice right people in the same way. Like I'm trying to think of what the equivalent of that tight line that I see on horses would be in people. I'm not so people will purse hold their lips. Mm, yeah, sure. Right. Versus being having a relaxed face and mouth, right? So and that was amazing to see what your shoulders did when you did that. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's about the only way I can get it to happen. Consciously, anyway. <laughs> I'm sure it's happening non-consciously, like a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. So so again, having that flexibility in our life and our in our tissue right, makes it easier for us to go into a stressful situation and 
easily come out of it. You know, my favorite example to talk to for the people is you want to be able to drive down um, a fairly busy road and somebody cuts you off and you want to be able to quickly respond and then forget about it. Right. And not be on high alert that, oh, my God, somebody might be doing it again. Um, right. Right. We want to be able to forget about that and relax and shake it off. Right. But we don't have that big shake that the animals do. And so being able to use our breath or or just have that awareness that, oh, I went up into that high tone place. Come back, come back, come back, you know. And that's so important for riding, you know, that rider, so many riders don't realize they've tightened their shoulders or they've tightened their elbows or they've tightened their arms. Sure. And, and, you know, what we're, what we're taught is sit up straight and, you know, shoulders back. But the problem is, as soon as you pull the shoulders back, you've pulled on the reins. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and so it kind of sets us up for that, uh, that tension. And, you know, how many riders have you seen that they're trying to have the perfect posture, but what they've done is they've tightened everything to try and achieve a look instead You're of right. a function that right. follows with the horse. And, you know, I think the upper body is an area where, you know, between driving our cars and working on computers and trying to sit in the perfect posture, it just, we, you know, we forget. Right. Well, we forget. We, yeah. we struggle with how to do it. Right. Well, yeah. How to do that in a in a in a way that's not increasing the sympathetic tone, that's not causing that tension, because that's going to transmit right through the reins to our horse. Right. So I like to say, go for the feel. Right. Go for the feel. Right. What would it feel like if you could lead with your heart? Ah, Right. And that instantly sort of opens up your chest. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Um, you know, show me how much you love your horse. And it's like, ah, yes. Right. Um, especially when you're sitting up there, of course, you want to go hug them, too. But <laughs> yeah, but those are great images, you know, because it's it's more about the expansion of the chest than what you do with your shoulders, because right. it's just resting on your ribs. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And again, it's a way to create space, right? Create yeah. space in your body without closing up. You don't want your back closed up either, but you, you want, you want your, um, your whole shoulder girdle to open up and get expansive. And, and again, as we expand, then so do our horses, right? They start to expand too, because again, that whole field theory of energy, that's so beautiful. You so know, talk so about well. that field of that field theory. Field theory. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of different people that have, um, that have touched on that. Rupert Sheldrake's a, a great one. He's got an old book um, he, that he's revised. And I like the old, older one better because it's not quite so technical. And he wrote about um, dogs that know when their owners come home. Oh, and, yeah. And he did that great study where um, they actually recorded the dogs as the person was getting ready to leave work and the dogs knew how did they know how did they know from miles apart right how did they know and they knew there was another in that book there was this great story of a cat that um remember back in the old phone days when you had the wired phone and you know the handset and all that um that every time the husband called the wife the cat would knock the phone off the hook but not for anybody else. Oh, how wow. I have not heard that story before. That's really cool. <laughs> Isn't that great? So how do they know? So there's this fabulous bit of energy that happens, right? So it's, you know, physics, all, quantum physics, all that, that they talk about. Um, Einstein, I wrote this down because I was hoping we'd get here. Um, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance which of course is like the best definition ever. And the fact that it came from Einstein, Einstein. makes it even better, right? Yeah. So he defined it as the ability of separate objects to share a condition or state. Wow. So separate objects. So which means that they've even found, right? Particles that can change to waveform that can change back to particles, right? So yeah. they, again, sharing particles that split. I don't know how they do that. But um, <laughs> it's way beyond we me. We need a physicist to understand that. Exactly, one. Yeah. exactly. And you know, we've all had those examples of you think you've been thinking about somebody you haven't thought about in you know five years or three years or whatever, and suddenly 
you get an email from them or a text or you see them on Facebook or something like that, right? Or they call you up and, um, you know, those out of the blue kind of things. And you're like, oh my God, I was just thinking about you a week ago, you know, and here you are. So, so there's something out there more than what um, Newtonian physics really, really covers, right? There's something that's bigger than that. And that's what, you know, it's, I identify it as field theory, um, which fits beautifully with a herd of horses that are standing out in their field mm. and go stand in the, in the herd of horses. And the energy is different when you stand inside the herd or when you're outside the fence over by your car, the energy is different, right? And so when you learn to take the time and quiet down and stand in that, there's just something that's really quite magical about it, right? And um, I find it very soothing and very relaxing and incredibly comforting, right? So horses being prey animals, they're so incredibly sensory, right? In a way that we, most of us will never learn to appreciate, mostly because we've got these fabulous overactive frontal lobes, right? <laughs> so yeah. that, that want to think everything through and, and know what it is, right? Um, and that's important. It's really important. I don't want to take away. So all these people doing, um, finding out the whys and the how comes and studying the, the bits and pieces, I think is so significant um, and important. And I want to be able to go look it up and find their research but I don't wanna be looking at, that's not where my heart is, right? I wanna go play in the energy of all of that. And when I start moving fluids and that connect with the fascia, right? And, that, and change that energy dynamic, then that's what lights me up and being able to help that flow. Yeah. So. It starts as field theory. It start like you said, with your fabulous horse with the liver issues, you know, that he, when you were in a bad mood, he was in a bad mood, right? When you were happy, he was happy, you know? Um, when you were tense, so was he. Um, uh, you know, and how many horses have you come across where the, the rider is not breathing, right? And so the horse doesn't breathe either. And then they learn not to breathe. And it's like, woo, stop. <laughs> So again, there's that energy dynamic. And when, um, when we can recognize it and call it out, it has, when we bring our attention to it, right? It has the ability to change. And if we don't call it out and bring some awareness to it, then it will keep in the same pattern. Yeah. You know, I, I, you're talking about a herd just makes me think of a little funny story that years ago, um, I had retired a horse to Virginia and I went to see him and I parked my car in the field. And then I think I went and rode him. And when I came back, somebody had reached in and grabbed my car seat and bitten out a big piece. And the whole herd was standing around. And it was such an interesting, not me, not me. Not me. I, didn't, I don't know, you know, they, but it was this very chagrined feeling. Right all of them they're all standing nearby but <laughs> exactly exactly oh that's great that's great so perfect example right um and dogs of course are classic at that too so um it wasn't me it was it was him it was somebody else yeah <laughs> somebody came in and bit your car we didn't do it <laughs> oh that's great but yeah that you know that energy's there and we really shouldn't um discount it uh, it's really makes me wonder, you know, not, uh, um, uh, I, 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 this is just a question and I'm just going to pose yeah. this to you. So uh, we used to have three horses and unfortunately, uh, one of the horses passed a couple months ago, you know, we tried desperately to save her, but, um, we yeah. still don't know exactly what happened, but now uh -huh. I have the two right. and they have, uh, you know, they're this little unit pair bond, right? Yes. And so it's like when I take one even a little further away, you know, it's, it's how, is there a way, I guess is the question, is there a way to establish the connection with the two, even when they're not in the same physical space? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, there is. Yes, there is. And it takes, um, uh, it takes a lot of confidence on the horse's part 
to be able to um, feel that support at a distance versus right up. Same with people, right? Same with people. Um, well, and the interesting thing is that the one that I, I spent some time with and wrote, was writing before she died and had taken him away quite often. He's actually the more confident now of the two. Whereas the other one who used to be, you know, Mr. Solid right. is the one who's like this meltdown. Mm. <laughs> it's like, seriously, dude? Yeah. You're the one who's the ground in the world. And, um, right. So yeah. you just get him to reconnect with that ground, right? Ah, get, you know, get him, um, because he's had that experience of, of grounding, you just bring him back to that. I that's mean, that's great idea. typically I what I do is, yeah. um, you know, go out and, and uh, feel the earth a little bit more, you know, open yeah. the shoulders, breath, breathe it in, right? Um, love those big, beautiful trees that they have in, in Virginia, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, because it, it seems to me that it, um, I mean, I, I agree with field theory. I've had enough experiences um, in my life to recognize, I mean, I, the number of times I've called someone and they're like, Are, yeah, I was just thinking about you, you know, or I sent them a message. Um, and so it's, it just listening to you, it seems to me that actually we can tap into this and use it to our advantage instead of just having it as a random event. Exactly. And then going, okay, why am I having this problem? It's, it's, and again, it comes back to that conscious choice of actively employing the concept and then using that to establish what it is right. in terms right. of distance. Because distance really in field theory, there is no distance. There is no distance. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So the shortest distance, Dr. Uffledger used to say, um, the shortest distance between two points is an intention. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Isn't that yeah. beautiful? So yeah. again, set an intention like, oh, I was just thinking about Wendy. I need to reach out and, you know, and there she was, you know, so things like that. Yeah, so, I love that. So very, I, I think it's really important. And as we start to slow down in our days, and hopefully people are, um, and breathe a little bit more is to feel the feels, right? And not be thinking about it all the time to feel what is it, you know, so feel the anxiousness when it pops up, feel the, the tension when it pops up and go, oh, that's tension. I wonder, I wonder why it's there. Oh, because I'm struggling with having to figure out A, B, and C. Oh, A, B, and C is pretty hard. So yay, yeah, you, you know, get tense, but then be able to put it down and let it go, right? And being able to have that dynamic in your nervous system, which is, of course, where it resides. And um, if you don't have that kind of flexibility, that's when you go look out people like me <laughs> and, um, and help with that dynamic. Now, good massages can help that too. Um, but again, my specialty is the nervous system. And I talk about, um, I love that place of deep relaxation because for me, that's where profound healing happens and mm -hmm. profound restoration happens. And both of those things are really significant. And so um, I'll put it out there to the people listening. Um, do you take time during the day to deeply relax, to just stop, put the phone down, turn everything off and just relax, get sensory, right? Listen, what do you hear? What do you see? What do you smell? What are you feeling? What are you tasting? Those kind of things. And let that, those moments seep in. It's going to be a little challenging at first. And it can be a learned skill where we can get better and better at it so that we don't stay in that high sympathetic tone, right? Or so that we easily can come back and restore that restoration part is so important, especially when we're not 20 anymore, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so I love that restoration part. I think that's really good. And, you know, getting back to the stoic horses again, allowing them to go to their breath, to, to find their breath, allowing them to um, stand at the halt for 10 minutes. Un until they start to deeply relax, you know? No, I, I one time like I did a really interesting experiment and I just sat on my horse, I moved and then I sat on my horse and I just observed his breath. 
Yeah. And the thing Beautiful. that was so fascinating to me was how many different breathing patterns he cycled through in like 20 minutes. Yeah. Beautiful. And, oh, what a smart thing. Yeah. But it was, it was so amazing um, to realize that the horses also have a, a wide variety of breathing patterns. Right. We tend right, to right. just think of breathing as just in and out and in and out. Right. I mean, <laughs> right. You know, um, and that was, that was really fascinating. So, so when you're working, how, like, obviously you pay attention to the breath. Of course. Um, and so like, can you tell from a breathing pattern where someone is in that process? Yes. So are they shallow breathers? Are they deep breathers? Things like that. So back to um, how, how this course correlates to craniosacral work um, is William Garner Sutherland, who trained with Andrew Taylor still, um, talked about the, the breath being the breath of life. The, the flow of the cerebral spinal fluid was the breath of life, right? Because without the cerebral spinal fluid flowing, that rhythm and flow of it, we don't have that, um, the fluid drenching the brain and the spinal cord. So, um, so if we're not deep breathing, how can we have that whole rhythm and flow in our body? Our lymph isn't flowing as well, right? Our CSF doesn't flow as well if we don't have a good breath. So I'd love to say, breathe like you mean it. <laughs> And so, and, um, you know, my, I treat a lot of very busy women and, um, I suggest to them, we have to stop and go pee a couple times during the day. When you sit down, breathe, like you mean it when you're in your car and you're driving, you have to stop at stop signs and traffic lights, breathe, like you mean it. So there's just some little triggers, um, to help remind you during the day to take full deep belly breaths. For those of us that meditate, then it, it can be a little more routine for us. But a lot of us talk about how we should do that and, and don't actually. Right? Well, it's, it's really interesting that we get around to the breath because um, Becky Tenges was on uh, a couple of weeks ago and she recommended a book called Breath by Jason Nestor. James it's Nestor. Fantastic. It's fantastic. I, I listened to it. I've listened to it twice now. And great. It, it's well read. He reads it. It's well yeah. read, well written, oh, which oh, is good. really important. But it's really packed with uh, just a ton of great information. And, yeah. and in listening to you, I'm kind of making the connection between the diaphragm the diaphragmatic breathing driving the fluid system. I mean, in, right. in that book talked about how the diaphragm is actually going to influence the pumping of everything. the heart. Everything, right? right. So, everything. Yeah. yeah. So it's all connected, right? So, right. so I love to focus on the nervous system. And we also learned in cranial one about the significance of the diaphragms, right? So the, 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 um, the whole shoulder girdle, they call that the thoracic inlet, you know, in cranial sacral work. And there's a big diaphragmatic area there, the respiratory diaphragm, the pelvic diaphragm, the diaphragm at the base of the skull, uh, things like that. And you want to have that mobility um, in that so that it's not pulling, um, uh, having a, a tension draw on your central nervous system. So you know, it all keeps, I, it, I just love it because it all keeps connecting and reconnecting and layering and, and deepening yeah. this whole understanding that we have of, yeah. and, and the, you know, it comes back to what an amazing creature we are. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you know? exactly. Exactly. We have everything we need and sometimes we need a little assistance, right? Yeah. So sometimes we need a a, a instructor to watch us ride. And sometimes we need a little body work to remember how to relax better and deeper, right? And, or, to, or a coach to help us eat better or whatever it is. Um, so we need each other um, to get the field theory thing back into it too. And yes, we're all, we're all it's so important. It's so important. We're all connected. Yeah. So. And our horses, uh, uh, ground it. I mean, I think that that's it, one of their primary functions is to bring us back to the present, right? And ground us in the here and now, even when they're in their sympathetic, it's still about being present. Yeah. They don't, they don't know, unless it's been taken out of them, they don't know anything else. Right. 
So, um, but again, dealing with our traumas, we don't, we don't get through life unscathed. So, <laughs> so, um, you know what, I, I think lessons. that it, in so many ways, um, you know, I go, I go back to some of the teaching of Dr. Feldenkrais and mm. the health, he always talked about health being the ability to recover. And, you know, so much of the people I talk to and my own personal experience, if I hadn't had the traumas I had, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. Exactly. You know, exactly. It's those, it's those things in our lives that, that right. we learn, if, if we choose to learn from them, they actually become gifts as it's, opposed to traumas. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, you know, and I think one of the best examples is, um, um, whose name is totally escaping me. The guy that um, was in the Superman movie that fell oh, off. Oh, Christopher Reeves. Christopher Reeves, right. He said he became Superman after his accident. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's pow I, I mean, people that find that kind of wisdom, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing, right? So learning from our stories, that's what it's all about, right? Like life is happening for us, not to us, right? Yeah. So. So and our wisdom is there. So yay. Yay. Well, this has been a, another awesome talk. I think we've kind of covered a lot of topics and kind of a the, lot of topics. Right. I, yeah, bounced around a little bit more than maybe we should have, but that's I, okay. That's why, you know, these webinars are are a place to kind of free flow. It's totally yeah. Cool. All right. So well, if thank you. Want to find out more about you, Karen. Where can they go? They can go to my website, which um, yeah. Anyway, um, it's it's not as as fabulously updated as yours is. I love your new logo. It's oh, it's thanks. really gorgeous. Um, and my my coffee cup. Woohoo! Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> um, um, yeah. So I'm not quite as well branded, but there's a lot of great information, and it's at uh, KarenPartish.com. It's K-A-R-E-N-P-A-R-T-I-S-C-H.com. And feel free to um, reach out and connect. And um, I do hands-on work. I also do remote work for people and for horses. So just Great. put that shameless plug out there too. So, yep, no right. Well, so, thank you so thank much you. for coming back. And thank you everybody for joining me today. Just remember you can find this and all the other webinars on the Surefoot Equine YouTube channel. Have a fabulous day. And then on Thursday, I'm just gonna give a plug for Thursday. Um, Ida Hammer and I are gonna go through the Doppelhoof. I just got my, I did an unboxing video that I posted up on Facebook. So if you haven't seen that, go to Murdoch Method on Facebook. And it's, I, right. I just love the packaging. You open it up and there's this black, beautiful black accordion paper with a string. <laughs> and, it's like, and it's a way to learn how to trim without having to um, hold your horse's leg up for hours. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> really. it's, very, it's very clever. It's very yeah, clever. It's awesome. It's great. All right, thing. so we'll see everybody on Thursday, eight o'clock Eastern time, uh, seven o'clock Central time. And thank you again, Karen. Have a fabulous day. Thanks, Wendy. Take good care. Bye. Bye.